In this video, I want to talk about a few things that are kind of off the wall. They're still a part of this research that I'm doing, but they go to a different place. It's not just identifying the material, but it's looking at the material and realizing after interpreting it, what it is doing, how it is sectioned, how pieces are put together, and how we can see that there has been a morphing of religion along the way. And we can see how the things that would show us that have been... Tr Religion has tried to hide them, or somebody somewhere has tried to hide the things that would show the commonality between myths and religions. It became very obscure. In this video, I want to take a look at a couple of things. After analyzing them, you realize a few things. Like, for example, do we know that Adam had a first wife that was Lilith? Genesis is not the beginning of Jewish mythology. There are things that predate Genesis, that if we understood them and see the morphing, and that Eve was actually his second wife, but it's not written that way. But I'm also going to show in the Bible where there are two different authors, two different styles of writing right where those pieces get inserted, and how we can look at the Bible and see that in Genesis there is an older part and there's a newer part. We'll read two different styles and show how that works and then go all the way down to Christian time and show how a similar thing was happening where people, it almost looks to me like people were having parlor get togethers, writing all kinds of stories on this material and all of those got, we got to get rid of them, but fragments of them are here and there and they sound weird. Gospels of Mary, secret gospel of Mary, things like that. Those are perfect examples of the material being taught perfectly, but being taught from the perspective of the inner self and not from the consciousness or not from third person. It's You hide all that stuff. When you look at it, you go, okay, I see what's going on. With only Jesus teaching it and nobody else teaching it, it looks a lot different than if everybody's teaching it in different ways. All right, my name is Dan Paulson. Welcome to the video. Let's get into that. Now, first of all, everybody, I am not an expert in all these areas. I, uh, I approach and I learn from experts in their areas. I have become expert in one area that nobody else is, and that is finding this template by learning how to re read the story in the conceptual manner than it is and recognizing how they're doing it. It's, it's a learned process. So that is what I'm doing. I'm approaching material and I'm bringing in their experts and then looking at something that even they, I, they don't see. Okay. First of all, I want to sample here from, um, if you don't know the channel, it's called Esoterica, Dr. Justin Sledge. This guy is great. If you are interested in esoteric teachings, I highly recommend you, you log on to this channel. I'm going to sample a couple of things right here from him, and then I'm just going to move on. Abrahamic mythology represents one of the longest continually developing religious traditions in the world, from its origins in ancient Canaan to postmodern theology and mysticism, Yahweh, various angels such as Michael and Gabriel, the, of course, the demonic forces led by Satan or Belial or Beelzebub or Samael, take your pick, have all come to become household names, not to mention, of course, Jesus, Muhammad. Gens and thousands of pages of religious scripture. For over 3,000 years, Abrahamic mythology has developed, spread, and flourished on the world stage of religion. Now, I just want to talk about my thought process as I'm listening to this stuff. My head shifts. It's like I have a rolling thesaurus or something going on up there. And what I just heard him describe right there is that Abrahamic religion is evolving. He never said that, did he? Listen to it again. It's evolving. For over 3,000 years, Abrahamic mythology has developed, spread, and flourished on the world stage of religion. But one figure in that mythology finds their origins well before angels and archangels, before messiahs and prophets, before perhaps even Yahweh. The figure of the demoness Lilith reaches back in some form to ancient Sumerian and Babylonian mythology, but came to flourish especially in later Jewish mythology. Indeed, it's arguable that no other figure has undergone such development 
from divine being to rebellious first wife of Adam to an infant murdering demoness to a being of primordial evil, a wife of the anti-god Samael, then split into younger and older variants, said to have been hewn from the divine throne itself to even becoming the divine consort and later Kabbalistic speculations. And finally, a feminist icon in the 20th and 21st centuries. I don't know how much that means anything to me other than the fact that we're looking at this morphing of an individual that's come along, but that, that it's taken on a demon status. It, obviously, it, here's a character that has taken on a number of different roles, but there's one very specific one that we're looking for, and that is the idea that Adam had a first wife that was Lilith and then a second wife that was Eve. Listen to this. Let's explore the complex origins and development of Lilith, the Night Maiden. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. If one were to travel back in time to the streets of ancient Babylon around 2000 BCE and inquire among the Ashipu or the Mashmashu, the ritual experts in that time, about the god Yahweh, the angel Michael or Raphael, the watchers Semyaza or Satan, they would probably just look back at you in a confused stare. Indeed, those mythological beings were centuries, if not millennia, from being developed in the crucible of apocalyptic Judaism much, much later. But if one were to inquire of those Ashipu or the Mashmashu about the Lili or the Lilitu in Akkadian, one might very well see the blood flee from their face in dread terror. Lilith, in some form and in various numbers, has haunted the imagination of people long before monotheism, dualism, long before any Yahweh or Satan. In fact, Lilith may well be the oldest surviving mythological figure in all of Abrahamic mythology. Okay, now as I'm listening to Dr. Sledge talk through this, I'm listening in my mind and going, I know what Lilith is. Lilith represents my inner being first life. This is my first self before I need to take over. So I know that the evil that that is, what is coming at, what is my life like? That's Lilith to begin with on the template. Mythically, whew, it's many, many things, but on the template, it's your early self. And the evil is what we have no control over that comes out of us. Though, as we'll see, the origins and development of Lilith is anything but simple. It appears that the earliest conception of a Lilith wasn't a singular distinct being or personality, but a class of apparently malevolent sub-gods or what we might call demons, the Lilu along with the Lilitu and Ardat Lili, at least in Akkadian, or the Maiden Lilith, seem to have been largely creatures that dwelled in remote or deserted regions of the earth and were especially dangerous to pregnant women, to babies, and also even to young men. Some Lilu and Lili, these are both Akkadian versions of the Sumerian Lil, may have also been associated with insanity and wind demons, such as their purported leader, Pazuzu. Okay, to me what they're doing is building up the idea that there are many different things that act out of us for different reasons, and that all of these different demons are not one thing. It's not that I have one problem, it's that I have bunches of problems. I'm dragging a lot of stuff with me. I can resolve this, but things are still happening. All of those are demons. I'm seeing all of those components in this misty swirl in my head that they're me. Let's go on. However, in a lesser known and largely lost text, sadly, which is terrible because it must have been a compendium of ancient demonology and uh, the Midrash Abkir, this portrays Adam as a kind of saintly figure, unlike the depiction from the Talmud that we mentioned earlier where he kind of goes on a demoness fornication bender. Sounds good. He's actually ascetically separated himself from Eve in this story following their sin and the murder of Abel by their son Cain, which introduced both death and murder into the world. Thanks, Adam. However, in this account, Lilith is actually so powerfully attracted to Adam, he sort of gleams like the sun, that she forcibly mates with him, probably when he's asleep, and over the course of 130 years of his isolation, he sires myriads of hosts of demons which go on to plague humankind down to this day. 
Okay, so my takeaway here is that before we see the iteration of Adam and what we know of Adam in the Bible only, that, that Adam was actually um, a larger story, that there were more things going on than what it came down to be fixed as in the Adam and Eve story, the creation story in the Bible. Yeah, Adam was, was a different kind of a person. And then what else do we have here is that the Lilith character is the one, what is that? That is the inner self acting out. We are the consciousness that has had a life experience. The inner experience is now acting out. It is on top. It is ruling over us. We are not in charge at that moment. This is developing how the, the mental hierarchy works and who's in charge and who's not. I suspect that she was probably on top in those nightly romps, so Lilith laughs last. However, it would be in the pseudepigraphic Aleph Bet of Ben Sirah, composed sometime around 700 or 1000 of the Common Era, that the myth of Lilith would reach maturity. Pseudepigrapha. We don't know who actually the author of it was, number one, and number two, it's in more recent times. So what we're doing here is not looking at it for historical accuracy with respect to it being something prior to Genesis. It obviously is not. What it is, however, is an account from somebody else who has this knowledge in the background of the template and is trying to continue to create the stories on that template. If they're good at it, we'll see it. If not, we'll see that too. Let's go examine it. In that text, Lilith appears for the first time as the first partner of Adam, made from the same clay that he was, and thus equal to him by all rights. Famously, she asserts this equality by insisting on being on top during an act of sexual intercourse for which Adam refuses. It's kind of vanilla, and in defiance, Lilith pronounces the ineffable name of God and disappears into the air. In this brief tale, thousands of years in the making, these mythological strands fuse into a truly enduring narrative. Lilith, the defiant first partner of Adam, becomes the murderer of infants in her fury, which can only be repulsed through angel magic. All right, that last story was the completion. The final iteration is in more recent times after the Adam and Eve story in the Bible. So what we're looking at here is actually not any truth to it whatsoever. What we're looking at to me is the idea that originally Adam and Eve, according to the, the, the final iteration, were created from the same source. They were created equal. And in the mental hierarchy, that's not the case. There's a consciousness and there's what we store away. And those are not equal. They do not have an equal role. They don't function the same way. And that's what they're trying to illustrate right here. The conscious and the subconscious are not going to function the, the, the right way. Now, when the subconscious wants to be in charge and is acting out is, and is on top, that illustrates the idea that we are acting out, that this is the inner self that is taking over and in charge, and we don't want that. We don't want that earlier self. We want it to be gone. So instead, that goes away that represents a healing then we become where does eve come from eve is our inner self that comes from our side instead of equal to us it is subservient to us because it is taken from the side again they're using the story elements here to develop a mental hierarchy this didn't really happen in in, in real life you can see that that didn't happen it's ridiculous to think so honestly but what it represents very clearly well not very clearly if you understand it, what it represents is that your inner self is a product of you and that it is subservient to you. But when it takes on things like in first sin, it's going to have pain in childbirth. You're going to suffer together, the conscious and the subconscious, because of what we've taken on in life. So I can see that there would be a reason later on, though, is the religion comes about to say, you know what, we have to tighten this up. We, start someplace, go at creation right there, and let's begin. And let's see what we've got. Get Lilith out of there, but we've got more things going on. We're going to start with the creation story and a basic Genesis, but we've got to add to it. What I want to do is go to Genesis and look at the first two creation stories and identify why those were done, probably at different times, but certainly by different authors. They don't even sound the same. Let's look at why. Okay, for the purpose of this, I'm just using a new revised standard version, an updated edition, and this is from Genesis 1. I've got things kind of uh, set up a little bit different here. 
Uh, but what I want to do is say this, okay? Now, as I as you get into here, like look down here at number four. There's something that says, and God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate. And then it goes through it, what it should do. And down here it says, and it was so. And if we go down through these, we're going to see, let the waters, and so God created. Let the earth, and it was so. Let this, do do this, and that happened. Do this, and that happened. Do this, and that happened. We're seeing kind of a doublet of things going on right there. First, I'm going to command that this is what I want, and then that is what happened. So that is a something that is very consistent in this verbiage. You will see that there. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And saw and God saw that it was good. So they're repeating what to, br to bring into being. And then after bringing it into being, repeating the same thing again. That is a consistent pattern throughout the seven-day creation story. Now, when we start on this, the next creation story, it's the five rivers. Listen to how this sounds. I'm going to just jump into the middle of it somewhere. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one, okay, I'm going to stop right there. To me, I read this and it reads like a, a, a like water. It reads like a flow. If it read like the first creation story, I'm going to, re, I'm going to repeat, uh, change something up here. It would sound like this, verse number six. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. The other one would have been like this. And God said, let a stream rise from the earth and water the face of the ground. And it was so. God made the stream to rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground, and God saw that it was good. You see how they're both describing things, but in different ways. One of them in a just smooth flow along, and the other one in this kind of this, calling it in, then it happens, calling it in, then it happens, calling it in, then it happens. So you can see right there that those two creation stories are different. They're authored by different people, and they have a different sound to them, and there's a reason that they have that difference that becomes more complicated. But let's look at something else. Okay, this is a little bit more spread out, but I'm going to show you something. This is about the Great Flood, Chapter 7, Noah's Flood. Here's a line, Chapter 4, For in seven days I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights. And a few lines later, there were, and in seven days the rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, now, I want to jump to... What does that sound like between the first two? Does that sound like it could have been added in, or does it sound like it could have been... Well, let's put it this way. Does it sound like it matches with the first creation story or the second creation story style? Now, watch this at Babel. One short story. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Well, anyway, I'll stop there. I don't have to read the whole thing. What I want to say is you can see that it has a style where it is not doing that calling in, and then it happens, calling in, and then it happens. So there's different things that are happening in here that are different styles that are clues to something that is going on. But something else I want to point out here. We had... I'm, I'm contending there's two creation stories, and one of them ends at seven days with a 3-7 grid. Let's take a look at something here. Years ago, I saw this, and I could never get an answer. Today, I look at it and go, okay, it's a seam. I know what it is now. This is Noah being called. The Noah being called is the first of the inner healing path. This begins a path, but 
there used to be one by itself and then it got added to here's the original one this went to the this went with the five rivers story and of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you they shall be male and female of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every kind shall come into you to keep them alive. We've got a second one. This is where it turns from the old one that only had one pathway to this one that now is going to start branching out. But they're doing something in the background to let the seeker know this time you are to take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and, the, and its mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and its mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the air also, male and female, to keep their kind alive on the face of the earth. All right, now what I'm suggesting is that there is enough patterns in here for me to suggest the idea that that seven pairs relates to the seven-day creation where seven is said three times. There's a grid pattern that's beginning there that has to do with other material. But right here in looking at that, I see now that there was one calling that didn't feature that and then one later that did. The seventh three creates a grid pattern that makes the story repeatable, which means before that was there, there was an original story that didn't repeat likely. It still had everything in there, but probably like the Enuma Elish, it had a creation, the simple creation, the five rivers up to the time where it needed to be, there needed to be a destruction and then a flood and then a purging on the other side. Now, the stories sound a lot different, but if you read the Enuma Elish, what you would find out is that there is a female character called Tiamat, who is the original one who kind of gives up everything. This is the, this represents the early female version and Tiamat has to be completely destroyed and split apart. And that would represent more closely the Lilith story. If Lilith was still in, Lilith Tiamat, oh yeah, this early self that needs to be destroyed. And then going on and building a new city or something like that. That would have been the original story. The Babylon would have been there and then moving on. But the, what happened then is you can see a numbering system in the background that came online. So what would that mean to me if I was looking at that and going, wow, that's, there once was a Lilith who was taken out. Lilith isn't there anymore. We're told that it's sacrilegious to even consider the idea. Um, however, I can see that if Lilith was there, it would have felt fit the template as, as a mental hierarchy. It would have been just fine in the story. It would have been something more in lines with Babylonian works, though, not with current Abrahamic works. It would have been sort of transitional. You know, you could see evolution of things in here if you're interpreting that people that are not interpreting won't even see. For example, from Genesis, um, Purity is represented by being naked. You're being uncovered by something. Spiritual purity means you are not covered by anything. That's a tough analog. It was okay way back when, but later on, it's like we can't we can't have everybody we can't have every man out there that is pure or consciousness, honestly, man, man or woman that is pure, call them naked anymore. That just doesn't fly. Hmm, what are we going to do? Okay, so now they have pure white robes. If you read through the Bible, you will see those morphing or evolutionary steps happening as well, if you know what those means, that, that, that those are analogous terms, that they don't mean what they, what, what they say on the surface. They mean uncovered by something or pure, not hiding anything. Then you see the transition. Okay, here's another clue, and I find it to be glaring if you think through it. That is where the chapter divisions are in the Bible. Let me talk about that just for a second. The chapter divisions we know are not original. The Genesis doesn't have chapters and verses in it from way back when. That came about later because the advent of writing made it so that people could now study from a distance. And instead of having it memorized, you had to say, okay, in book so-and-so, chapter so-and-so, verse so-and-so, then they could go look. So it, it came online later on. It was uh, like 1227 or something like that, A.D., Stephen Langton, Archbishop of Canterbury, is the one that put the chapter breaks in the Bible. He's the one that put them in. Stephen Langton, Archbishop of Canterbury. 
put the chapters and breaks in the verses. He knew what he was doing. If you go through Genesis, you will find 50 chapters. 50. There's supposed to be 50 exactly. There are 50 steps. There's one thing that is odd, though. If you look where everywhere he broke the chapter, one story stops, the next story begins. Except for one place, and that is right in the beginning where the two where the two creation stories are. And very specifically, this is what I mean. Let's go back and take a look at Genesis right here. What I've done is I've pulled up a, a copy here, a different copy, one that I don't have modified. This is a King James Version, and it shows right here where chapter 2 begins. And what does it say where chapter 2 begins? Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all the work which God created and made. So right there was the finish of that one through seven creation story all the way up to resting. Seventh day, that's going to end up being the Sabbath day, isn't it? Chapter two should start here. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth. And So this is before everything happened. You can see that there's the start of a second story that does it, that, that's right there where that chapter break should be. You see that it's very purposefully not correct. It looks like it's, what's it doing? Is it trying to point that out or is it hiding it? And again, just at a cursory glance between the two, you see where in 1 through 7 they're continually repeating things, where in chapter 2 it starts off where it's not doing that. It's got a smoother flow to it, a different sound to it altogether. There's a reason the repeats are happening. They're counting something for us. 7-3 grid starts right there at day 7, said three times. Okay, this will just get very deep. What I wanted to do right there basically is show that it looks to me like there was a big change in the, the material at one point in time in, in Jewish material where it was shifting from Babylonian material. It looked like there was a transitional something there with Lilith and something else going on, and then this eventual morphing into the Genesis that we see now. That's what it looks like to me. And then Genesis having been added to with enough evidence in there that you can see where seams don't overlap and where styles are even different. There's enough evidence there where I think that that makes sense to me. And then what happens? You get down the stream and we get to Christianity. What happens? We're going to change the religion quite a bit. We're not going to be Jews anymore. We're going to become Christians as far as the carrier case for the template. The template is going to stay the same, but uh, we have to change the way it sounds. People aren't going to be Jews anymore. It just doesn't sound... This is old stuff. There's a lot of weird things in here in in the Torah, <laughs> you know, the, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things in Genesis that have to do with uh, you know giving up your wife to Pharaoh to uh, giving up your daughters that are virgins to somebody else things like that that at some point you're like okay what am I doing with that all right so I'm just going to do this very quickly I'm I'm going to have to just paraphrase it all here at some point in time what I see if I'm looking at a distance is I see this incredibly prolific influx of new material it's coming out in many ways it's not just in the gospels it's in what do we have lost scriptures let me read a few of them here we've got the gospel of the Nazarenes the gospel of the Ebionites Hebrews Egyptians those are old ones the uh, gospel of Thomas the unknown gospel, gospel of Peter, Mary, Philip, the gospel of truth, the gospel of the Savior, the infancy gospel of Thomas. There's a bunch of different gospels from that time that didn't make it into the Bible. And you read through them, and some of them sound like they might belong with the material, and some of them don't. So there's a point where we're looking at things even like the gospel of Mary. And you go, yeah, that's a no-go. But you, this is where I said in the early on where it, it almost looked like they they must have parlor get-togethers. They figured out what was going on and everybody's trying to make their own versions of stories. They're not just writing the four gospels. They're also going, oh, I'm going to do the gospel of Mary. What are they doing? They're teaching the material from the perspective of the inner self. Genius. The gospel of Thomas. This is from 
a, an aspect of you that isn't your consciousness or your subconscious, but another part of you. So they're utilizing the same template, but telling it and they're trying to find all manner of different ways verbally to carry it, to make it sound different. And it's very creative. At some point, though, it gets over the top. There's even one somewhere about um, Jesus. I might have it in here. I'm not going to look it up. You look it up. You'll find it. There's one where Jesus spends an evening with the young man to help him. He, the, the, the young boy was thinly clad and Jesus helped unrobe him and they spent the night. And that's like, whoa, what is that? That's a very, it's got some pretty severe homoerotic undertones to it. If you look at it on the template, what it represents is that your inner self, the offspring that don't, man, I got something that bothers me a little bit. Tell you what, resolve it now. Don't let it go on forever. That's what it really means. If you've got something big, don't let it grow and grow and grow and grow until it's a big monster thing. It's going to get worse. We have to resolve things. So it works perfect. We're going to resolve stuff when we're very, when it's light. Take care of, take care of uncovering your offspring. You want your offspring nude, but the way it sounds is like, Oh, we don't want that. No, get rid of that. So Pete, you could see people are using very artistic ways of, of carrying this. Yeah. Um, okay, so then what happens, I see the same sort of thing, is that all of that information needs to be dismissed. It needs to be shut down. It needs to be gone. It needs to be dismissed. It needs to be, People need to be told it's heretical, that there's something wrong with it. When you read it, you go, you know what? It's doing the same. It's, it's fitting the same template. Where it becomes critical is when people uh, treat the material as historical as opposed to understanding the template that is there anyway so as you're reading through these things if you were to grab for example i'm going to read something from lost scriptures bart ehrman there's one called the shepherd of hermas the one who raised me sold me to a certain woman named rhoda in rome after many years i regained her acquaintance and began to love her as a sister all right, I'm not sure what this is going to turn into yet. It sounds kind of weird, but I'm seeing male, female, woman, uh, sister, that there's some sort of element of perhaps a mental hierarchy. I'm going to keep watching for that. When some time had passed, I saw her bathing in the Tiber River, and I gave her my hand to help her out of the river. When I observed her beauty, I began reasoning in my heart. I would be fortunate to have a wife of such beauty and character. This is all I had in mind, nothing else. So this could be our conscious looking at the inner self and saying, I want this purity. I want the nakedness. When some time had passed, time goes by, I was traveling to the countryside, glorifying the creations of God and thinking how great, remarkable, and powerful they are. On the way, I fell asleep and a spirit took me supernatural aid and carried me through a certain deserted place that was impassable for the place was steep and split up by courses of water when i crossed the river threshold i came to level ground and bowed my knees and i began came to level ground that would be like going to the desert and i bowed my knees and began praying to the lord and confessing my sins well yeah okay so i'm going to read this and go this is a monomyth right here i I have not studied it, but if I go through to read it, I would go, yep, this is going to fit that criteria. All right, here's another one on the origin of the world. Seeing that everybody, gods of the world and humankind, says that nothing existed prior to chaos, I, in distinction to them, shall demonstrate that they are all mistaken because they are not all acquainted with the origin of chaos nor with its root. I would say that chaos would be what acts out of us and the root that we're looking at cause and effect. Here is the demonstration, how well it suits all people on the subject of chaos to say that it is a kind of darkness. Yeah, we don't know what it's coming from, but in fact it comes from a shadow, which has been called by the name darkness, and the shadow comes from a product that has existed since the beginning. It's existed since the beginning of our calling it into being. Okay, uh, the origin of the world, good, good stuff. That would be a good study. What else do we have here? got one called the letter of Barnabas greetings sons and daughters in the name of the Lord who loved us in peace so great and abundant are the righteous acts of God toward you that I am exceedingly overjoyed beyond measure by your blessed and glorious spirits for you have received such a measure of his grace planted within you 
a spiritual gift. Okay, I don't see cause and effect. I don't see a hierarchy. I don't see male, female, purity, nudity, anything in there. And so I share your joy all the more within myself, hoping to be saved. For truly I see that in your midst the Spirit has been poured out upon you from the abundance of the Lord's fountain. So amazed have I been by the sight of your face, which I have so desired. This is not going into a monomyth. The, the letter of Barnabas is not. That is not a teaching or it's not a spiritual path. This one is a Christian who doesn't know that path, who wrote a letter to Barnabas that is worship. I, you know, the church is wonderful. You guys have great, wonderful continents. I'd love to join you is what that one is. So you, as you read through them and begin to interpret and analyze them, you see what works and what doesn't, but you begin to see that all of the material fits together in a certain way. And when you see the commonality there, that kind of, it kind of invalidates other things. Let's just leave it at that. Um, all right, that's it for this video. Yeah, you, George, you said about 100 years or so after Christendom began, was this material lost? And I'm looking at this going maybe a couple hundred after that. I'm not sure when the timing of all of this is. But you can see that people are writing. They're not writing the religion. They're writing material on the template the same way as Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John. The exact same way. Except that they are using different perspectives and different intent with the analogs. Hope this was fun. See you in the next video.